everyone, the doctor is in and today we're going to continue with the lecture on physical diagnosis of the cardiovascular system. And we'll start with the blood pressure determination by palpation and auscultation. So I'm going to send you a link of uh, different videos showing how to do this, but we're going to discuss this step by step first. So first is you have to let the patient rest for at least five minutes in a quiet setting with feet on the floor. So you have to take note class that you have to have at least five minutes. So when you talk of this time, uh, it may be longer. You may have them rest at 10 to 15 minutes or even 30 minutes if the time allows you. Second is you have to position the patient with an unclothed arm at heart level that is supported at the mid chest level if supine or in a standing position. So this is at the fourth intercostal space at the level of the sternum, meaning the arm should be at the level of the heart. Third thing that you need to take note is you have to choose a correctly sized cuff because there are pediatric cuff and uh, cuffs ad available for adults. Then we have to start wrapping the cuff around the arm correctly. It should not be too tight and it should not be too loose because it will affect the determination of the blood pressure. You have to place the stethoscope over the brachial pulse, so it will be shown in the video where it should be located and it should be underneath the cuff. So inflate the cuff approximately around 30 millimeter mercury above the pressure at which the brachial or radial pulse disappears. So when you start to inflate the cuff, of course you have to um, make sure that you listen using your stethoscope until your Brachial pulse disappear or palpate for the radial pulse. And when it disappears, you still have to add 30 more millimeter mercury of pressure. Uh, and then slowly deflate the cuff for about 2 to 3 millimeter mercury per second. And listen for the carot cuff sounds at, of at least two consecutive heartbeat, which marks the systolic pressure. So take note, when you're starting to deflate the cuff, this is one of the uh, difficult parts when you're still learning to use a uh, blood pressure monitoring uh, tool because you would have to make sure that you deflate it not abruptly but slowly at a pace of 2 to 3 millimeter mercury. So when you hear the first two consecutive heartbeats which are the loudest, this pertains or it marks our systolic pressure and these sounds are called Korotkov sounds. So please take note of the spellings. Spelling of this term, carot cough sound. And after that, you slowly continue to deflate the cough at 2 to 3 millimeter mercury and listen for the disappearance point of the heartbeat. The last strongest or loudest sound marks the diastolic pressure. So after listening to that, we then report the correct blood pressure in millimeter mercury. So this is a process, this is one of the most important uh, assessment tool or process that you need to learn when we talk about the physical diagnosis of the cardiovascular system. And there are different things that you have to remember. When you measure the BP at higher arm levels, the blood pressure recordings will be lower. And if you measure it at a lower level, the blood pressure recording will be, on the other hand, is higher.
On the next slide, we talk about jugular venous pressure. So this jugular venous pressure is important as uh, this is a non-invasive procedure that will help us determine the pressure in the right atrium or what we call the central venous pressure. So we know that the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava drains in the right atrium. These are the two largest veins in the body. So when we measure the pressure in the right atrium, we are also measuring the central venous pressure. So how is the jugular venous pressure, pressure best assessed? Um, this is best assessed from palpations in the right internal jugular vein. Take note, not in the left, but in the right internal jugular vein. Because this is directly in line with the superior vena cava, which drains in the right atrium. So you have to take note of that. So in estimating the uh, ju jugular venous pressure, this is one of the most important and frequently used skills in physical examination. So you have to master this. Um, you have to remember where the internal jugular vein is. So we try to um, understand this anatomical structure. So we have here the internal carot carotid artery. Uh, we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle, your external jugular vein, uh, and then the subclavian vein. We can see here the large carotid artery, and then um, behind it is the internal jugular vein. So this is the right side. Now take note, this the internal jugular vein, it lies deep to the sub uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck, and they are not directly visible. So you cannot, this, they are not directly visible underneath the skin. So you must learn to identify the pulsations of the internal jugular vein that are transmitted to the surface of the neck. Note that this jugular vein and pulsations are difficult to see, especially in children who are less than 12 years old, and it's not useful at this age group. And the pressure changes from the right atrial filling contraction and em emptying they cause fluctuations in the jugular venous pressure and its waveforms that are visible to the examiner. So we'll learn about the A wave, the V wave, and other waves of the jugular vein pressure. So um, this observation of the pulsations of the jugular vein actually gives us a very important clues about the blood volume status in the right atrium. Uh, the right and left ventricular function, uh, patency of the tricuspid and pulmonary valve, and the different pressures in the pericardium, and arrhythmias caused by junctional arrhythmias or junctional rhythms, and AV blocks. So, for example, if the JVP falls with, if uh, for example, if the jugular venous pressure falls, it may mean that you have loss of blood or decreased vas vascular tone and increases in right or left heart failure. So it's a very simple procedure. It is uh, a non-invasive procedure, but it gives us a lot of uh, a lot of diagnostic clues to certain heart conditions. I just want to point out that we have what we call the oscillation point of the internal, internal jugular vein. So this is used to estimate the level of the jugular venous pressure. And uh, we have to learn to find the highest point of oscillation in the internal jugular vein. Alternat alternatively, the point above which the external jugular vein appears collapse. So... This oscillation point, uh, we will get to learn about this as we try to use the JVP or jugular venous pressure as we try to measure it and we practice to measure it. Okay, so in this pet picture, we, sh we can see here how it is done. So it's very simple. You just need a ruler and a horizontal card. So it's usually measured in vertical distance above the sternal angle. So anatomically, you have to know the location of your sternal angle. So in a vertical distance using a ruler, okay, um, this is also the sternal angle is also called the angle of Louis. Okay, so this is the bony ridge that is adjacent to the second rib where the manubrium joins the body of the sternum. So, it says here that 
when the JVP is measured at 3 cm above the sternal angle or more than or greater than 3 cm or more than 8 cm in total distance above the right atrium, this is considered elevated above normal. Okay, so what is the correct position when measuring the jugular venous pressure? So this is very important for us to know. And in these three positions shown in the picture, we can see that the sternal angle remains roughly 5, C, 5 cm above the right mid atrium and in the in this patient the pressure in the internal jugular vein is somewhat elevated so let's talk, talk about the different positions one by one in position a where the patient is in a semi folders position elevated at 30 uh, degrees the top of the internal jugular vein okay let's start with position a the jugular venous pressure here cannot be measured because the level of oscillation or meniscus is above the jaw. So we have here the jaw, and this is the level of the meniscus. So if this is the position, we cannot measure. Therefore, uh, therefore the jugular venous pressure oscillation is not visible. Therefore, we are not able to measure it. Here in position letter B, the semi fowler's position is elevated at 60 degree degrees. So the top of the internal jugular vein is now easily available here. And if since it is easily available, the vertical distance from the right angle, okay, or from the angle of Louis using a right angle to the level of the oscillation can now be measured using a ruler vertically and a horizontal card. So we can now measure it at 60 degrees Celsius. Now on position C, we see here that the patient is seated or probably standing in an upright position. The patient, uh, the veins are bare, barely discernible, so it's very difficult to discern the vein, veins in this position. Therefore, we cannot measure the jugular venous pressure. So some authors or other books, they report that a 30 degree to 45 degree may be used to estimate the JVP and I mean, the, the estimated JVP may be 3 cm lower than catheter measurements from the right mid-atrium. So um, what we are going to use here is a ruler and a horizontal card. So as emphasized earlier, if the JVP is greater than 3 cm above the sternal angle or greater than 8 cm above the right atrium, then this is considered to be elevated or above normal. Now we have in this next slide the steps for measuring the jugular venous pressure. We have seen the picture. It's quite easy to understand, but let's discuss this one by one. So first, you have to make the patient comfortable. Raise the head slightly on a pillow to relax the sternocleidomastoid muscle on your right neck, on the right part of the neck rather. And raise the head of the bed or examining table to about 30 degrees. But if you have difficulty visualizing or if you cannot discern where the location of the oscillation of the JVP is, you can still elevate the patient, elevate the head of the patient. And then we turn the patient's head slightly away from the side you are expect inspecting, so towards the left portion. We use a tangential lighting and we examine first both sides of the neck, okay? So we have to identify the external jugular vein on each side, then find the internal jugular venous pulsations as well. Now, if necessary, you may raise or lower the head until you see the oscillation. So this is what we were talking about earlier, When you, if you remember the three positions. So now focusing on the right internal jugular vein and after finding the pulsations in the suprasternal notch, between the attachments of the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the sternum and clavicle or just posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. We can now start to distinguish the pulsations of the internal jugular vein and the carotid artery. Later in the next slide, we'll talk about the differences of the pulsations of the jugular vein and that of the carotid artery. Now, in the next step, we have to identify the highest point of pulsation in the right jugular vein. So we have to extend a long rectangular object. So that's what I was talking about earlier, a horizontal card. Okay, and from this point, 
uh, and a centimeter ruler vertically from the sternal angle, making a right angle. And now we make the measurement. So uh, here, measure the vertical distance in centimeters above the sternal angle where the horizontal object crosses the ruler and add to this distance 5 cm. So, mag-a-add ka ng 5 cm. So, if, up, if, you're, if this is your measurement, okay, add 5 cm and the distance from the sternal angle to the center of the right atrium, that is the 5 cm that we added. So the sum is the JVP. So take note, uh, from the sternal angle to the level of the horizontal card, we still add 5 cm and that would be our measurement of our jugular venous pressure. Okay, so in this slide, uh, we now discuss the differences in pulsi pulsation. Take note, for an internal jugular palpation, it is rarely palpable, unlike that of a carotid pulse. When you try to assess the pulsation at the carotid area, it's easy to determine the carotid pulse. So if you first try to palpate it, and the first the first thing that you will be able to palpate is actually the carotid pulse pulsation. So another difference is for an internal jugular pulsation, we have a soft biphasic undulating quality, usually with two elevation and characteristic inward deflection or descent. So inward, there's an inward deflection. While that of a carotid pulsation, we have a single outward component and it is vigorous. While an internal jugular pulsation is soft, the carotid pulsation are, pulsations are vigorous and outward. Pulsations eliminated by light pressure on the vein just above the sternal end of the clavicle. So since it's a soft pulsation, it is also eliminated when you put pressure. While when you, pulsate, uh, when you palpate a carotid pulse, it is not eliminated by pressure. Okay, so your internal jugular pulsations, the height of the pulsations changes with position normally dropping as the patient becomes more upright. That's why in a, uh, in, a, in a fully upright position, we are not able to measure the jugular venous pressure. While that for a carotid pulsations, whether in whatever position the patient is, you can still palpate the carotid pulse. So the height of pulsations usually falls with inspiration, while the height of pulsations are not affected by inspiration for the carotid pulse. So uh, in summary, we can see that for carotid pulsations, it's very much palpable, it's vigorous, it's outward in component, it's not eliminated even if there is pressure, it does not change or it, is, uh, it does not disappear even if you change position and the height of palpations are not, pulsations are not affected by inspiration. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. So we see here on this picture, the carotid pulse will be assessed next. And when palpating the carotid pulse, we use the middle finger and the index finger and or we can also use the thumb. So take note, when we talk about the carotid pulse, it's very important to assess this uh, for its amplitude and contour, and also if we will be able to assess for thrills or buoys. And this, assessing the carotid pulse provides us very valuable information about cardiac function, especially about the aortic valve. So it will, it will show us if an aortic valve has stenosis or regurgitation. So that is what are the things that we can assess when we try to palpate the carotid pulsation. So we have to assess its amplitude and contour. And also take note that when palpating for the carotid pulse, to never palpate both left and right carotid pulse together, as this may decrease blood flow to the brain, which may cause fainting or syncope. So here... Um, in the next slide, we talk about the amplitude of the pulse, which correlates reasonably with the pulse pressure. So the contour of the pulse wave, namely the speed of the upstroke and the duration of its summit 
and the speed of the downstroke is the contour of the pulse. So when we talk about contour, this pertains to the pulse wave. So sometimes for beginners, it's very difficult to assess the pulse wave. So the normal upstroke is brisk or fast. It's smooth, rapid, and follows S1 or the first heart sound almost immediately. The summit is smooth, rounded, and roughly mid-systolic, and the downstroke is less abrupt than that of the upstroke. Now, if there are variations in the amplitude of the carotid pulse, either from a bit to bit or with respiration, so we have to assess that as well. And the timing of the carotid upstroke in relation to the first heart sound and that of S2 should be noted as well. The normal carotid upstroke follows S1 and precedes S2. So it is very important to know this relationship because it's helpful for us to correlate uh, or identify the first heart sound from that of the second heart sound, especially when our heart rate is increased and the duration of the diastole normally longer than systole is shortened and approaches the duration of a systole. Okay, so in the next slide, we can see here um, the brachial artery. So in patients with carotid obstruction such as kinking or thrills, uh, you assess the pulse in the brachial artery. So we're going to apply different te techniques in assessing the brachial artery. So the patient's arm should be at rest as shown in the picture below with the elbow extended and the palm facing upwards, not downward, okay? So the palm up. Cup your hand under the patient's elbow, okay? Cup your hand under the patient's elbow or support the forearm. Just like here, we can see the other hand supporting the forearm. So you may need to flex the elbow a little bit and uh, use your index and middle fingers or your thumb of your opposite hand for palpation and then feel the pulse just medial okay medial to the biceps tendon so medial to that of the biceps tendon so the sequence of the cardiac examination should also be emphasized because knowing the proper sequence will help us uh, properly conduct the examination so first we have to take note the uh, position first we they have to be in a supine position with the head of the bed elevated at 30 degrees and um, we examine first the jugular venous pressure and followed by the carotid pulse, after which we inspect and palpate the precordium. Okay, inspect and palpate the precordium, starting off with the second right and left interspaces, then the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So as you can see, we start from the superior portion going down. Including, of course, the assessment of the apical impulse. What is its diameter? Is it increased or decreased in the, the diameter? Is it is in its proper location or is it displaced? What is the amplitude and the duration of the point of maximum impulse? Now, we proceed. Um, if the patient is, if we put the patient in left lateral, the cubitus, okay, we can now palpate the apical impulse to assess its diameter. So listen to the apex with the bell of the stethoscope. We'll learn about the parts of the stethoscope in a little while. So supine with the head of the bed elevated at 30 degrees. Now we listen to the second right and left interspaces down the left sternal border, okay? Um, and to the fourth and fifth interspaces and across the apex, the six listening areas with the diaphragm, then the bell. So start using the diaphragm and then the bell. And there are six listening areas. So listen to the lower right sternal border for right-sided murmurs and sound, often accentuated with inspiration and using with uh, the diaphragm and the bell of the stethoscope. Sitting, leaning forward after full exhalation. Okay, in a sitting position, listen down the left sternal border and at the apex using the diaphragm of the stethoscope. So here, we now discuss the inspection and palpation. We can see here uh, the picture showing us the right second interspace for the aortic area. Then the left second interspace for the pulmonic area. 
the right ventricular area, which is located near the sternum. And we have the epigastric subsiphoid and the left ventricular area, which connotes or pertains to the apex of the heart. And upon uh, doing this, we have to perform a careful inspection of the anterior chest because a careful inspection will, will already show us the location of the point of maximum Ill impulse or um, the ventricular movements of a left-sided S3 or S4. So using a tangential light, you shine it upon the superior portion or surface of the chest, okay, uh, the, the over the cardiac apex to make these movements more visible. So palpation begin with general palpation of the chest wall. In women, keeping the right chest draped first, gently lift the breast with your left hand and ask, or ask the woman to do this to assist you. So it will be a different assessment for women and that of men to provide privacy. Now, when we talk about palpation, we first look at uh, this diagram, which shows us what part of your hand will be used to assess uh, for hips, for thrills, and for localized pulsations. So S1 S and S2 and S3 and S4 will be palpated as well. So using the techniques below, palpate in the second right interspace. So we, we start here to the left second interspace. All right, and then this is followed by um, um, assess uh, palpation in along the sternal border, okay, along the sternal border and at the apex for heaves, thrills, and impulses of the right ventricle and the four heart sounds. So when we talk about palpation of heaves and thrills, we are going to use the palm and uh, heaves and lifts. What is the definition of heaves or lifts? So ito, when we talk about this, um, these are actually sustained impulses that rhythmically lift your fingers. So sustained impulses that rhythmically lift your fingers. That's why it's called heaves or lifts. It is produced by an enlarged right or left ventricle or atrium and occasionally by ventricular aneurysms. So next, for thrills, we use this portion of the hand. So we press the ball of the hand here, okay, firmly on the chest to check for a buzzing or vibratory sensation caused by underlying turbulent flow. So my mnemonic is, because uh, we are often asked, what is being palpated? Is it a thrill or a brewy? So my mnemonic, for me to easily remember it, is palpate thrill like the letter t at the end of the word palpate i immediately connect it with the word thrill so palpate thrill so it's easier for me to uh, remember that palpation will uh, be used to assess for thrills so it is used to assess for turbulent flows flow fl turbulent flow so if it is present you will be able to palpate it Alright, so palpate impulses from the right ventricular area, so using your finger uh, pads for localized pulsations. Now, in the left ventricular area, this is how you're going to palpate the apical impulse in the left lateral decubitus position. So you may palpate using one finger. Okay, so you may uh, palpate using one finger. So the apical impulse, as we have mentioned earlier, will show us different cardiac um, pathologies, such as hypertrophy of the ventricle. So here we see the mid-sternal line and that of the mid-clavicular line. We have mentioned earlier that um, if, if the diameter, if the apical impulse, it should be normally located medial to the mid-clavicular line. But if it's located lateral to the mid-clavicular line, then it is now already considered to be displaced. So on this next slide, we now try to assess the right ventricular area. So we have seen how the left ventricular area was assessed earlier. Now we're going to palpate the right ventricular systolic impulse. So in the left sternal border, 
third, fourth, and fifth interspaces with the patient's supine and the head elevated at 30 degrees, the patient will be asked to exhale and briefly stop breathing. So exhale and briefly stop breathing and then we're going to place the tips of uh, our curved fingers in the third and fourth and fifth interspaces to palpate for the systolic impulse of the right ventricle. So if there is a palpable impulse class, we have to assess its location, its amplitude, and even its duration. So occasionally, um, we, uh, we are able to assess for uh, diastolic movements on the right-sided S3 and S4, which are palpable. So palpate in epigastric area if we have an increase in AP diameter. So in an increased AP diameter, ask the patient to inhale and briefly stop breathing. So palpate the right ventricle in the epigastric or subsiphoid area. So uh, with your hand flattened, press your index finger under the rib cage and up toward the left shoulder to assess any right ventricular pulsation. So we're going to assess this if there is an increase in AP diameter. So for assessment of the cardiovascular system, we take note that percussion is actually replaced by palpation. And we rarely use percussion in estimating the cardiac size. But if uh, there are cases where in the apical impulse is difficult to palpate, then percussion may be our only option, but it has limited correlation with the cardiac borders. So now next we proceed to auscultation. And when we talk about auscultation, this is a very important skill and it's the most widely used method in order for us to assess valvular heart disease. And when trying to assess this, we have to follow the six auscultatory areas or review these areas. So we start off with the second right interspace for the aortic area, followed by the second left interspace for the pulmonic area. Then going down, following the left sternal border to the tricuspid area, now assessing the apex or the mitral area. So this is the auscultatory areas of the chest wall. And if we, you remember, the radiation of the heart sounds or murmurs, the aortic sound may be heard over a very wide range represented by this blue oblong, uh, blue colored oblong shape. And then the pulmonic area can also be extended here in the yellow oblong line or shape. And then we have here the tricuspid area and of course the mitral area in the, or the mitral sound on the apex of the heart. Of course, we have to also understand that the parts of the stethoscope as we're going to use this for auscultation. So we have here the ear pieces, uh, the headset, the ear tube, okay, and th the tubing, the stem. This is the bell. The smaller circle is the bell and then the diaphragm. So this is called the chest piece and this is the headset. So the smaller circle is the bell while the larger one is the diaphragm. So it's very exciting to get your own stethoscope and take a picture of your stethoscope with you. If you feel na doctor ka na or, or nurse or a midwife, if you already own your stethoscope. But aside from owning the stethoscope, you should also know how to use it and when to use it. So for the diaphragm class, we use this it, because it's better uh, for picking up high pitch sounds of the S1 and S2, we use this for those types of sounds. The murmurs of the aortic and um, mitral regurgitation and pericardial friction rubs can be best assessed by a diaphragm. The bell, on the other hand, is more sensitive to low pitch sound. Therefore, this is better with S3 and S4 sounds. So important notes, oh, kasi sabi lang natin ito, the diaphragm is for high pitch, so S1 and S2, and then we have to press it firmly against the chest. While the bell is more sensitive to low pitch sound, so S3 and S4, and we have to just apply it lightly with just enough pressure to produce an air seal with its full rim. Use the bell at the apex more move medially along the lower sternal border. 
So the pattern of auscultation is described on this slide. So we have to start at the apex moving to the base. Okay, so the point of maximum impulse medially is lo located medially to the left sternal border. So we're going to uh, superior then superiorly to the second interspace across the sternum to the second interspace and the right sternal border, stopping at the sixth listening spot. So we start from the apex, moving to the base of the heart. So from the apex to the base of the heart. So alternatively, we can also start at the base of the heart and inch our stethoscope towards the apex. So uh, first, we start at the right interspace going to the left, second interspace along the left sternal border, and then to the fifth sternal border and then towards the apex of the heart. So we just follow this. It means you may start from the apex to the base or from the base to the um sorry from the base to the apex or from the apex to the base of the heart. Okay now auscultate or take note uh, this is a reminder nice reminder for us that when we auscultate for the S2 uh, we auscultate at the base of the heart for the apex, we auscultate at the, uh, we auscultate uh, the apex to hear the S1 louder. And to check for murmur, uh, palpate the carotid pulse while auscultating the chest wall. So these are different positions how we can do auscultations. So for mitral stenosis, in the we can auscultate it in the left lateral decubitus position in the mitral area. And then to auscultate for aortic regurgitation, the patient should be leaning forward. So what are the different tips for identifying heart murmurs? So take note when we try to assess them, we have to un uh, understand different factors. We have to time the murmur. Is it in the systole or diastole? There, that's why we call some murmurs systolic murmur or diastolic murmur because that is the time when we best heard the murmur. So what is its duration? Okay, locate where on the precordium is the murmur loudest. Is it at the base? Is it along the sternal border? Or is it in the apex? And does it radiate? Um, there are also different maneuvers or positions where you can ask the patient to lean forward or to uh, turn into a left lateral the, the cubitus position depending on the type of murmur that you would like to listen to. And of course, the shape of the murmur or the, the size of the murmur can also be determined. So uh, is it crescendo or decrescendo or is it hollow systolic? And very important for us to understand now that is there are different grading intensity for the murmur from grade 1 to grade 6. So we have to determine its pitch and quality. Pitch and quality. So I identify the associated features such as the quality of S1 and S2 and the presence of extra sounds such as S3, S4 and or the presence of additional murmur. So of course, make sure that you listen in a quiet room. So it's really difficult to assess patients' class when there are a lot of people, such as in per conducting medical missions. Sometimes it's difficult to really assess because of a lot of people and because of the crowd causing so much noise. Now, this is what I want you to, to uh, understand and try to memorize by heart, uh, the different grading of the murmur. So it's like, in grade school, we have grade 1 to grade 6. So, sa grade 1, parang ganun din nung nag-aaral pa tayo. Nung grade 1, tahimik pa tayo lahat. So, we were very silent. So, very faint. Nahihiya pa tayo. So, very faint. They are heard only after listener has tuned in and might not be heard in all positions. Well, agreed to murmur. It's quiet but heard immediately after placing the stethoscope on the chest. Unlike that of the grade 1, which is very faint. Grade 3, on the other hand, is moderately loud. And take note, class, this is what we usually ask in exams. When can you assess a palpable thrill? Or what grade is the murmur if there is already a thrill? So, grade 4 is the answer. So, palpable thrill. And at grade 5, we now have a very loud murmur with thrill and may be heard when the stethoscope is partly off the chest.
So it's already relatively very loud. For grade 6, uh, this is very loud with thrill and may be heard with stethoscope entirely off the chest. Okay, so there are different maneuvers in identifying systolic murmurs. And uh, this slide shows us the different uh, maneuvers. So squatting, uh, valsalva, release phase. And then um, this maneuver will give us an increased left ventricular volume from increased venous return to the heart. So increased vascular tone as well, which increases arterial blood pressure and increases peripheral vascular resistance. So this is the cardiovascular effect and that the effect on systolic sounds and murmurs are the following. For a mitral valve prolapse, there will be decreased prolapse, prolapse of a mitral valve and delay of click and the short murmur is shortened. For a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for using the squatting maneuver, it will decrease outflow obstruction and decrease the intensity of the murmur. Well, for an aortic stenosis, it will increase the blood volume ejected into the aorta and increase the intensity of the murmur. So this maneuver has different effects. So some right now, it's quite difficult to understand it, but when you get to learn more about murmur, it will be easier for us to understand why this occurs. In a standing maneuver, so this is the strain phase when you try to strain, this will cause decreased left ventricular volume from decreased venous return to the heart because of the straining. So this will also lead to decreased vascular tone and decreased arterial blood pressure. So what will be the effect in a mitral valve prolapse? It will increase the prolapse and the click moves earlier in systole and the murmur lengthens. For a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it will increase outflow obstruction and the intensity of the murmur, while in an aortic stenosis, decreased blood volume ejected into the aorta and it will also decrease the intensity of the murmur. So please study these maneuvers in order for us to better understand these cardiac pathologies. So take note when uh, assessing the arterial pulses, any difference in amplitude and contour and upstroke should be noted. Um, the popliteal pulse needs, needs to be examined when lower extremity arterial disease is suspected. So this is located posterior to the knee. And the brachial pulse is examined in assessing volume and consistency of the peripheral blood vessels. So here we showed uh, he, the portions where the different pulses can be assessed. So we have the superficial temporal pulse, the external maxillary pulse, we have the left and right carotid pulse, the brachial pulse, the ulnar and the radial pulse, um, the femoral pulses, the popliteal pulses, posterior tibial pulse, and the dorsalis pedis. Now, upon finishing the conduct of the physical examination, we now record our cardiovascular examination. So here is an example of how to record a JVP. So for example, you may say the JVP is 3 cm above the sternal angle with the head of bed elevated at 30 degrees. Carotid upstroke are brisk without bruise. The point of maximum impulse is tapping. 1 cm lateral to the mid-clavicular line in the 5th intercostal space. So you see, we are describing the point of maximum impulse not only through its size but its location. So there is a crisp S1 and S2 and at the base, S2 is louder than S1 with physiologic split of um, A2 greater than P2. At the apex, S1 is louder than S2, and there are no murmurs or extra sounds. So that is an example on how we are going to record our findings. So it's very brief, but concise and containing all the necessary data. So in concluding a cardiovascular system examination, always thank the patient and observe courtesy towards the patient. So that ends my lecture on physical diagnosis of the cardiovascular system. Thank you so much for listening.